<clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Are you all ready out there? Everybody ready? Here we go. One, two. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. What you just heard was called Alexander's Ragtime Band, and that was written by Irving Berlin in 1911. Now, just imagine, that was, that was Irving's biggest hit up to that time. This guy went for another 30 or 40 years writing songs. He must have written 100 songs that are recognizable and still being played today. But that song is one of the jazz favorites. You still hear it played by Dixieland bands, no matter where you would go to hear them. So there's your culture and cultural enrichment for the day. And as normal, this is normal for us, but no other station or on, on TV or the internet does this, where the host comes on and plays a, a horn and plays a song maybe 50 to 100 years old. The only place you're going to hear it is right here on Life After Scientology, and I'm your host, Ron Miscavige. So let me put my as they say in the music business, my axe away. That horn is like an old pal of mine. It was made in 1915. It still plays great. And we have, before I get into the show, I got a little business to take care of. And there, there's some new patrons, which I very much appreciate. These are people who have signed up to donate something every month for the ongoingness of the show. And it is very much appreciated. I can't tell you how much because the show is going to go on no matter what happens, whether we have patrons or not. But those of you who do this, you immediately go from being a viewer or someone who's getting enlightened or maybe entertained into a participant. You're actually doing something about what we're talking about. And what we're talking about is some very suppressive, oppressive acts by the cult of Scientology. But anyway, those people I'd like to thank this morning are, number one, Paul Chown. I hope I pronounced your name right, Paul. Two dollars, and I thank you very much, Paul. And then uh, Pierre Louis Leclerc. Two dollars. Thank you very much. Very much appreciated. And then Justin um, Shapkin. I'm sorry if I murdered your name, but it looks like that's how it's uh, pronounced to me. And Justin, that's $5, and thank you very much. And then an unusual handle, MDR Slacker 01. Oh, it's a very common name. I know many MDR Slacker, but they're usually 02, 03. <laughs> I'm kidding around, buddy. $5, and I thank you very much. So thank you to all you patrons. And this morning, we have a special guest, a very dear friend of mine, and someone that you love to hear because her insight into what the Church of Scientology has done is just very insightful. And I enjoy her opinion on it and enlightenment that you're going to get. Please welcome Karen De La Curie. Good morning, Karen, and thanks for coming on the show. It's very much appreciated. Here Hi, everybody. Hi. Okay. So now we're going to talk about something that I don't know if it's been nailed down. But here's an overall theme, what we're talking about, and that is this. The human mind is capable of believing anything, and even in the face of countering evidence. And that is the cult common thread, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Get that now. The human mind is capable of believing anything. Karen, I'd like you to expand on this because we went over it. I have some notes here, and I think this is going to be very enlightening to our audience today. Yeah, you know, 
you were in 42 years i was in 40 years now we did have all those years weren't solid belief once you're in a cult the effort to leave is a whole other story i know listen karen i'm gonna tell you i'm not making people wrong for believing this way because i was one of those believers i was one of those people I recruited other people to come into Scientology. I recruited people to come into the Sea Organization. So did I. I would sell people lectures thinking that they were getting enlightened on the most valuable data in this universe. Don't get the idea that I'm doing this and laughing that people have done it. I honestly pity them because they're screwed up. And this is no, no small matter because to get out of that, It's pretty goddamn tough because it's your own thoughts that have you imprisoned. But anyway, expand on this because I I wanted to give my two cents on it, Karen. No, no, I'm. I like when we go back and forth. It's good. You chiming in is very important. The thing is that belief is such a strange thing if you glom onto it and you're just not willing to look beyond the tunnel that you find yourself in. Um, For some people, it's the Holy Bible, and that they just believe no matter. There are some harsh things in the Bible. There's a lot of goodness in the Bible. But what we're talking about is once you believe with a permanence and a continuity I think you create your own matrix and what you and I did is we were in a matrix completely contrived by by Hubbard and if Hubbard, see Hubbard, Hubbard's indoctrination and writings, Ron, you'll agree with me, was about everything how to clean glass, how to financially plan your budget, how to do art, how to paint, how to, uh, how to learn, how to study, how to find antisocial personalities, how to, he, he wrote the manual on everything, everything, how to sweat out your poisons, yeah. purification rundown um, how to distinguish between what was important and what was unimportant I don't think there's a certain subject in your entire life that Hubbard didn't write about now in Scientology there are two kinds of people that are participating those that are on source and those that are off source source was another word hubbard used for himself he was the source the creator of it all and if you followed his doctrines down to the t you were on source right and if you deviated from what he wrote hey you're off source therefore if you wrote up a little what we call CS, a little permission, a CSW, a little uh, thing, and you wrote it exactly, you had to ask permission the way Hubbard said you must ask permission. And if you wrote it exactly per the policy, you were on source. Right. But if you were inventing or creating something that there wasn't a Hubbard reference for, you were then off source. Do you agree? I agree totally. And you, and you you said something and I I think I should take bring notice to this. You said Hubbard was the one who created it. He didn't discover any truths. He created a lot of them. And there's a big difference between creating something out of your own mind that might not necessarily be true at all or discovering something. You could discover that the world is round, that's a great discover. But if you created the fact that the world was flat, 
Uh, you're screwing a lot of people up. Anyway, I wanted to bring that up because you, you said that he created this, and that's a good point, Karen. He actually did well, create it. He, you know, my ex-husband, Heba Jench, yeah. he was president of the church for a long, uh, long, long time. He got into incredible trouble by David Miscavige, a huge cram and a yelling and a reprimand because he was supposed to say on national TV that Hubbard discovered. And apparently there was some big thing. I didn't quite understand it all. I, so he would go through crime. He was never allowed to use the word created. Well, apparently, for whatever reason, the cult want to put out, they want to put out that these were truth discoveries karen i'm Hot telling you wash. This, this, is, wash. this is a big deal he let the cat out of the bag is what he did that's what he did <laughs> this was a creation yep. a complete mock-up like i kept telling you there isn't a certain there isn't a, how to wash yourself how to do your personal hygiene there are over there are a few thousand issues called flag orders yeah the flag orders is how you be how you do how you have and you are either on source following hubbard down to the t or you could get an ethics report on you like north korea <laughs> oh, boy. the ethics report would be that you were off source and by being off source, you were in violation of the 10 points of keeping Scientology working. Right. Because you weren't f applying the technology. Yeah, and uh, he, he created the whole thing, man, all day. And it just, it was, it was almost like he was trying to create people in his image, as if he was mocking himself up to be some type of God. You see what I'm he, saying? You know, in early days, I think there was benevolence and kindness and people, there was a lot of forgiveness and people worked together and so on and so forth. Scientology did morph. It yeah. did change through time and space. I, I agree, Karen. It, it was not this way when I came in in 1970, not at all. It's like going to a country club. Yeah. With a with a lot of friends and ambiance and good times and people were not driven to snitch on you every five minutes. <laughs> yeah, I know. But that all changed. It changed. It changed a lot. Anyway, talking about belief, the um, you see, I. I have a, a long, long-term friend who had a very, very abusive wife, and she would, when she threw temper tantrums, she was pretty violent. Uh, one day she threw a glass ashtray at him, and he ducked just in time. He could have been blinded for the rest of his life. And he had this idea that had continuity. Oh, Scientology will handle that. Yeah. Scientology will handle that. And because he was locked into this belief, even though the evidence in front of his nose was contradictory, Scientology wasn't. She was getting worse through the years. Yeah. Her temps increased. But... I'm just giving you an example because we're looking at this this prison of belief. The yeah. belief the belief was, oh, it, the next level, she just has to do more. Scientology will handle it. Well, Scientology did not handle it. And Hubbard himself was prone to rages, huge temper tantrums. I had to laugh on my suppressive person declare they had a sentence saying oh she yells sometimes she's she she 
this is the Scientology word, turbulence. She causes turbulence because she can yell. And I thought, my God, the person who wrote that suppressive person declare did not ever live with Hubbard. Hubbard was the personification of screaming tirades that would practically rock the Apollo. He could scream out of control. And I had a little blow up over my almost 20 years in the Sea Org, and this was suppressive. Yeah. The person obviously did not know Hubbard. Hubbard was incredibly prone to wild tirades that were almost like he was using a bullhorn. They were so, so loud. Yeah, I, yeah. I've, I've heard this from many people who worked with him. He said he was, he could not control his temper. He would just go out of control. Temper tantrums. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so looking at belief, um, the belief is that in this particular case, Scientology will handle. Now, another trick that Scientology has is you are never allowed to discuss what they call your case. Right. Baggage. Yep. Your reactive mind. The way you act. You can't discuss that ever with anyone. Not that, even husband and wife. That's can right. Discuss. Like you, you can't come out of session and let's say your wife was to say, how did it go? You can't say, well, you know, we ran this incident where I was doing such and such and this happened. You, you can't do that. That's forbidden. It's strictly forbidden. Yeah, that, in that, the cult. That would be an unethical forbidden. thing for you to do. Right. You, you, you're, you, you can only talk wins. This, this is like, not, you can only, if you can say, I had a wonderful <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but you're not allowed to discuss details of the case. So when she would violently attack him, you, you know, take up a weapon or weaponize something to claw, <laughs> she, she would she would apologize after her tantrum. She would apologize and then say, I, I can't talk about it. It's case. Oh, boy. Case is reactive mind. Yeah. Case. Right. Yeah. So. Well, uh, let, let's talk about some of these people who did some of the old OT levels. I, I'd like to get into that, if you don't mind. And this, this is people who many years ago went all the way up to what we call the top of the bridge. And I think in those days it was OT or operating Thetan six. Yes. And that would be equivalent to these days when a person would go OT eight. It's right. not this. Do you want to get into what that level was, by the way, Karen? Yes, I've got a little picture here of the first OT sixes. And I'm going to just hold it up. I hope I'm holding it up correctly. It's, it's perfect. It couldn't be better. Good. So here's this little group, and they went to the top. And you know what? In the never never land of Scientology, <laughs> all of them got declared suppressive person not that long after. Unbelievable. No, now, here's the contrary fact. Scientology parade themselves as the masters of the mind. They absolutely insist. The whole book, Science of Survival, tells you how to, hand, how to predict human behavior. This is their thing. We can predict human behavior. They have course after course after course telling you how to detect a suppressive person, how to shatter suppression. The PTSSP course, these are abbreviations of knowing who the troublemakers, who the antisocial personalities are. But when they take your money to go up to OT6 or OT8, they haven't detected that you're a suppressive person. Do you see the country? Do you see the evidence? Is Absolutely. That they don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's as plain as the nose on my face, you know? In 42 years, they didn't know you were suppressive. 
in 40 years they didn't know I was a person. But the moment we fled, we were overnight yeah. suppressive persons. And, overnight. And they knew it. <laughs> they knew it all along, right? They knew they they knew there was something up. Oh, when he left, well, well that guy was an SP. Well, yeah, but the point is, if Scientology is claiming they understand human conduct, they would have gotten me forty-two and years human ago. Human behavior. Yeah. Why did they allow all those years to go by without calling it on the cop? No, this is this is so. Worse than this is there's there, there's something called Saint Hill size orgs. Saint Hill size. Right. And this is a coined phrase meaning that a brick and mortar store they call a church, a brick and mortar outfit can so expand. They call it boom, that it be can become St. Hill's size, which means every statistic goes a hundred times more than it was. So if they had one counselor, they now have 100 counselors. Right. If they had one counseling room in use, they now have 100 counseling. So St. Hill was astronomically increasing Scientology is run by statistic right so increasing statistics so these old timers many of them felt the love and the forgiveness the early days were gentle and they all worked together and they created a boom and so on <laughs> And 93% of them have subsequently been declared suppressive person. Now, I, I'm asking you to look at a contrary fact here. The, the cult wholesale, every day of its existence, puts out issues, naming its own people, cannibalizing on its own, suppressive person. How incredulous is that? Well, look, they're nuts. What am I going to say? I mean, I, they, I've summarized the whole thing right there. Because you're right. Anybody who says anything wrong or a little bit off or leaves, they're an SP. Yeah. <laughs> Simple as that. You know, I mean, <laughs> no matter the fact that these people may have worked 80 to 100 hours a week to put that org into St. Hill size. And by the way, that St. Hill size was based on the fact that L. Ron Hubbard supposedly boomed St. Hill at one point and made this happen. But I think at that point, it was just about the only place you could go to do these levels. So yes. it would was sure. bound to happen if it's the only place. Now you have advanced organizations in St. Hills in Los Angeles and, and Copenhagen and, uh, you know, well, is, I guess there's none in Africa right now. There's only AO, an advanced organization. But that was the only place. So based on that, he says, oh, well, this should be simple. You should be able to do it easy. And it's true. Some of them went St. Hill size. They had a big video shoot. When the video team left, it was the air come out of the goddamn balloon that went down to what they were before. None of them have held that size ever since they started having St. Hill size contests. And what they now call an ideologue is supposed to be an org operating at St. Hill's size. Right. Right. And the ideal orgs are just a con. Uh, uh, what, it, what it is is they had this building in Clearwater called Superpower Building. And they were able to just hit on anybody who, who went to Clearwater. And they just gouged money. They got something like $275 for a building. They raised $275 with promises that superpower was going to change the planet. Wait, you said $275. You mean $275 million. million. I'm dollars, sorry. Yeah. No, I'm that's sorry. okay, yeah. $275 million. Million. $275. What building out in the boonies of Clearwater 
could ever be worth 275 million. Not even a Beverly Hills Bel Air home belonging to Leonardo Di DiCaprio would be 275 million. <laughs> In California, where where uh, real estate is astronomic, so they got 275 million dollars, but they just didn't get on with it. They didn't never. They got. They had to get a lawsuit by Luis Garcia, who who called them out on being frauds. They took in all this money, it didn't deliver anything, but they got the idea. Let's rake in money for an empty building. People will give money thinking, oh, this is going to be our little hangout. Even that is a complete con. Do you know that the hierarchy in Scientology after raking in all the money in different areas, they rent out that building back to the local church. Church of Scientology International owns the building. Do you remember I talked to you about two people in Orange County that each gave a million dollars for oh, yeah. Orange County? Okay. Yep, yeah. So all the people in Orange County thought, we're going to own our own little hide, you know, our spiritual retreat. No before the staff get paid, before right off the top, rent is paid to use the property. This is <laughs> the IRS. One, one cult, one little outfit pays another. This, the money goes from the left hand to the right hand within the cult. Yep. So the Church of Scientology International rakes in these huge sums of money from every, I'm not going to say church, brick and mortar little satellite org out there. Yep. Okay, so we're talking about belief. Yeah. And actually, your granddaughter, Jenna, Jenna put a book with an incredible title, Beyond Belief. And so much in Scientology is beyond belief. Can I just read you what I showed you the picture of this little group that went as high as they could go and then they were all suppressive persons. Yep. Right? Yeah. Kicked out of the church. You never get a refund, your money's gone, but you're booted out. Go away. Here's what Hubbard claimed OT sixes would attain. On this level, you will regain your abilities as a spirit. They call it Thetan. To be wherever you want to be at will. Uh, exterior to the body, meaning you're this floating spirit that can be wherever you want to be at will and be able to influence others at a long distance and you will also influence the universe of others that's supposed to be what you pay your five to ten thousand dollars for you can float around leave your body wander as you know go sit on the moon come away from the moon have breakfast on venus just be wherever you want to be, sit in the middle of the ocean. This is what is now, because of the prison of belief, people paid very good money to achieve this. Now, what's the contrary evidence? Nobody's the achieved it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it in a statement. Uh, how many people get raked in on this? And then they don't want to admit it because for them to say, guess what? It's a bunch of crap. They couldn't bring themselves up to do it. So it is the land of make-believe and pretend that we enter into. And there was a friend of mine back in Philadelphia years ago, Bob Michaels. He said to me one day, he says, you know, Ronnie, it seems like when you get to these higher levels, there's a lot of pretending going on. <laughs> Isn't that wild? He kind of summarized the thing in that one statement, Karen. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'll tell you, you we're, 
Go on, honey. No, the thing is, it's so crafty because you're you can never talk about your case. No. So you can't tell someone else. I never got that. No. That's so forbidden. That's off off limits. So if tons of people aren't getting it, they can't talk about it. They can't tell another person. Yeah, and I'll tell you, we're we're coming to the end of uh, our show right oh. now, Karen. Oh. Oh, okay. And uh, there was one other subject I wanted to bring up, but I don't think we could do it justice in a short amount of time. I'm getting a signal from my producer. Yes, Sean? The beer. The what? Oh, n never mind. Uh, had nothing to do with th what I was saying. But there was a person called Captain Bill. Do you think you can get in a short blurb, or would you rather do it on another show? Oh, well... Captain Bill was such a colorful character. We can certainly talk a little bit about this, and then, and then, um, you know, we can expand on him later. But Captain Bill. Okay, I'll tell you what. First of all, just just mm -hmm. get into it a bit, and a we'll, bit. And we'll okay. save it for the next show. Okay. Okay. Well, the point on Captain Bill goes back to the theme of the show, which is a human being will swallow and believe anything. Right. Captain Bill was appointed captain, uh, captain on the Apollo, deputy commodore, it, n number two in command immediately under, under Hubbard. Again, where is this science of survival of being able to detect who a person is? Captain Bill was sent to be the top dog, the apex of Aeolian. Advanced Org Los Angeles, the highest churches are in a hierarchy. This was the top one. And while he was commanding officer, he had a nightly ritual of sending Sea Org members to go on the roof to look for spaceships that were coming in. And wouldn't you know it? Sea Org members? believed that they should look for spaceships. And, and nobody says, hey, what the fuck is going on here? Huh? Yeah. Nobody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then he, he went further, Captain Bill. <laughs> he sent posses, he sent groups of Sea Org members to look for psychiatrists at, late at night to go find these deadly psychiatrists that were poisoning the civilization with their cre he he was he 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 was completely a hubbard replica of hating psychiatry and so there were these sinister little missions that were to go scrutinizing certain homes in in Los Angeles for psychiatry. I mean, this sounds completely what wall? I'm telling you. <laughs> right? but, and and Janice Grady's book Commodore Messenger One. It's on Amazon. Commodore Messenger One. Janice Grady goes into this story very, you know, yeah. very much in depth. But the reason I bring it up is, Sea Org members would go looking for bad, evil psychiatrists in the middle of the night. <laughs> oh, God. <gasps> okay, and, <laughs> and as, as far as what happened to him, let's hold it for the next show. Oh, okay. Because there is an ending to this that may surprise you. And I, of course you're going to come back. I don't even have to ask you that, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, love to. Okay, so I'm asking you, will you do another show? So you just technically, what is your answer? Yes. Okay, good. So we'll tell you what happened to Captain Bill, and uh, it'll surprise, and maybe you'll get a laugh out of it, and maybe not. But anyway, my producer has uh, something to say to me. Go ahead, Sean. Okay, Ron, you got a couple super chats here. So Jay Steen for $2 says, I enjoy your extra videos the last few weeks. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Gene Edmonds for 5 euros says, keep up the great work you do, Ron X. Thank you very much. And Chris Klenotes asks, Mr. Miscavige, Karen, I don't think I ever heard your true thoughts on Hubbard. Now, would you share? Now what? Would you share? He wants to know what your true thoughts are on, on Hubbard. 
He was a con man. There you go. That's my thought on it. I mean, I could go into an hour's monologue on the good things and the bad things, but the bottom line is he was a con man. And, uh, but a brilliant con man, I must say that. I will give him that credit. He was a brilliant speaker, charismatic, but in the final analysis, that's, that's, my, that's my two cents. Karen? You know, as I get older, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of the good and bad in almost everything. You're right. Even, even bad has good. Yep. And Hubbard was very much a dichotomy. Yeah. I did see his side where he, he wanted to help and he tried to uncover and unravel things mentally. But Hubbard's fatal flaw was his urge for vengeance. Yeah. He wanted to wipe out and retaliate against critics. And so you can't be, you just can't be a leader yeah. with such a mean spirit. So my true thoughts on Hubbard was he was uh, two things. He, he had he had good and bad in him, but so embroiled with one another that, and because he was in the limelight as such a thing, people remember the bad. Yeah. And and in the long run, you've got to mentally put up a bunch a scale, Lady Justice scales, yeah. and oh, go, yeah. does the bad outweigh the good? And if you look at how many destroyed families, how many people made bankrupt, how many people's lives destroyed on policies he wrote on disconnection uh, and so on, you've got to see that there's a heck of a lot of bad yeah. and that it outweighs the bad. The, the reason there are shows and Google and YouTube and Twitter and blogs and Facebook groups on and on and Tony Ortega every day, the reason that all that is happening is there's a heck of a lot of bad. Yeah, that's right. Well, I'm not even going to add anything to that. I'm tempted to, but I'm going to shut my mouth. And I want to thank you for coming on, Karen. So please, all of you out there, uh, if you feel impelled or you don't feel impelled, you just feel like becoming a patron, I'd invite you to do so today because it definitely helps the ongoingness of this show. And for me to be able to get people back like Karen, who has brilliant insight into a lot of facets of Scientology, I appreciate you coming on, Karen. So let's do this again. Meanwhile, this is Life After Scientology. I'm your host, Ron Miscavige. I will see you on the next episode. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.